Yes, I am. And Katie's here, my God. Who's the chair, you know? Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start with Katie. Katie, what is your question? Yeah, 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 it's free. Free for you, not yeah. for me. Yeah. <laughs> I would sell it to you. Uh, I wouldn't do that. It's one of a kind. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, my name is Carmen Branche. For those who maybe don't know, uh, I think everyone pretty much does. I'm going to present my thesis today called The Vibrochord Investigating a Vibrotactile Musical Instrument. Um, So one thing that I've noticed is that uh, technology and art seem to exist in the cyclical relationship where one is constantly influencing the other. Um, so as, you know, where painting, let's say, spurred the demand for imaging, then imaging itself spurred more demand for further technological de development, such as the, uh, the camera, which again uh, spurred more art, which in turn spurred, uh, spurred um, you know, encouraged more uh, technology. And so we've arrived at this uh, latest technological uh, development that has enabled a new form of art. And so that, uh, that development is called the Emoti Chair. And the Emoti Chair is a high density vibro tactile display. So what I've done is I've actually created a controller device for this display. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, my exploration, my paths through the design, construction, and evaluation of this controller device that when combined with the Emoti Chair, essentially enables a new form of art called vibrotactile music. So right off the bat, I'll just uh, list off my four major contributions that I've made throughout this work. And then hopefully throughout this presentation, I'll, I'll sort of back up these claims. So I've designed, constructed, and evaluated an input device called the VibroCord. Okay, that's number one. I've devised and implemented a new system of music appropriate for vibrotactile perception. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it, it, uh, I've determined that it's possible for vibrotactile music to convey at least the simple emotions of happy and sad. 
And also I proposed a mathematical model that describes the relationship between the emotional content, happy or sad, and some, some song characteristics. And I'll, I'll go into detail into each one of these contributions as I progress through my presentation. Okay, so I just I wanted to give you a very high level overview of some of the more important literature that I included in my literature review. So probably the, the, most, o the most overarching um, part of my literature review was a, a framework proposed by Omagrain in 2011. Uh, and what it is, it's a, it's a framework proposed for evaluating digi digital musical interfaces. So she's, she suggests four perspectives, so to speak, in which to examine a musical interface. And those perspectives are the audience, the performer, composer, the designer, and the manufacturer. So in my thesis, I use this to frame my work, but primarily with a focus on the, the first three perspectives. Um, and then in combination with this framework, I've used work from Wanderly and Oreo, 2002. Um, and in, that, in their work, they suggest uh, testing four controller qual uh, qualities. And again, they're talking about musical controllers. And the qualities are learnability, explorability, feature controllability, and timing controllability. Um, and what they recommend is having users perform basic musical tasks in order to uh, examine these qualities. And so what I've done is I've combined these two frameworks uh, in order to frame my own work and my investigation of the vibrocord. Um, so going into the design of the vibrocord, um, there were a few design constraints, primarily um, as a result of the limitations of the sense of touch. So for example, your skin has a much smaller range of perceptible frequencies, up to about a thousand hertz. Whereas the piano, for example, the top note is somewhere around 5,000 hertz. So it's a much smaller range. Um, you need, uh, there needs to be a much larger difference between frequencies before you're able to determine that they're different if they're presented to your skin. So for example, semitones at the beginning of Furalise, you can hear those, but you can't feel that difference. Okay? Also, you need slower tempos because the temporal acuity of your skin is much lower, much poorer than that of your ear. So um, if, let's say, your ear can discern rapidly occurring clicks, and they can occur much, much closer together than, say, if you presented them to your skin, and still being able to determine that they're two rather than one event. So those are um, sort of three limitations imposed by uh, the, you know, basically how your skin senses vibration. Another limitation is that the, uh, the experiencer of vibrotactile music needs to keep their skin in constant contact with the display. So this is unlike most audio displays where you can maintain a distance. So this is another um, limitation or constraint. Finally, there's one advantage, and that is the Emoti chair, because it has eight independent channels of vibration, allows you to encode not only in frequency and amplitude, but also in space. So you can present stimuli with identical frequency and amplitude, but in different locations, and people will experience those as different. So that gives the artist um, a, a basically a, an additional dimension to, to work with. So this is the final version of the, this version of the, the VibroCord. So it, it's essentially a MIDI controller. And what I did was repurpose five MIDI keyboards. So each one of these groups here, you can see the black and white, um, they, are, uh, they are a single MIDI device. And what I did was I coupled it into a system. So this is the system diagram. So this uh, VibroCord feeds full five independent channels of MIDI to a MIDI controller, which is then fed into a laptop, which is running a bit of software that reads the MIDI information, which is basically what note was pressed and how hard was it pressed, and then plays through, this is an audio uh, device that allows me to, exp uh, to output eight tracks of audio. And from there, that audio is then amplified and delivered to the Emoti chair. So the bit of software in that laptop determines what frequency and where to deliver that frequency, depending on which keys are pressed. So the VibroCord, I use a um, group to place mapping, meaning so as you move from group, as you, let's, so let's start on the far left here. As you move to the right through each of these key groups, the vibration will move up the chair. So this group, group, key group A on the far left, that'll play vibrations on the very lowest part of the chair. And as, as you move up, as you press the keys in within that group, the, the location stays the same, but the frequency changes, goes up. 
And so that pattern is uh, repeated as you go up. So the next keyboard will play vibrations a little bit higher, and then the farthest right will play vibrations at the, at the very top. Okay? So in the, and I'm taking advantage, as best as I can, of that ability to encode in space. Okay? Um, okay, so I'm going to start off to, to talk about I, uh, my, the studies that I ran. So I did four studies, one of which had two phases. So maybe four and a half studies, if um, really. And so the first study was an initial, uh, uh, initial introductory study aimed at just getting some, some reactions, some initial reactions from some experienced music, uh, audio musicians. So there are no experienced vibrotactile musicians, and I figured audio musicians would be the, the closest thing that I, that I could get to uh, an expert user. So what I did was I, in, a, in a, over a one to two hour session, I brought in uh, each, for, for each participant, I brought in uh, one at a time four, uh, four composers or musicians, and I just I asked them about the vibrochord, and I explained to them vibrotactile music, and I just got their opinion uh, about the, the keyboard and about vibrotactile music in general. <clears throat> and so what I found, gen you know, generally, we can talk more details later on, is that the uh, <clears throat> participants seemed relatively positive, I'd say cautiously optimistic about the design of the keyboard and of vibrotactile music itself. They recommended a few things, lowering the keyboard, keeping the key the, the, the size that I had at that, at that time, changing the amplitude mapping, so they wanted lighter touches to result in, in stronger stimuli, <clears throat> and they suggested a few things I wasn't able to include in this version, such as a foot pedal and other controllers. Uh, and they also thought that vibrotactile composition using the vibrochord seemed reasonable. So I, uh, I felt comfortable moving on. So in my second study, I wanted to determine if the vibrochord was in any way an improvement over existing controllers. I wanted to see, you know, and I think the most obvious controller in this case would be a, a piano controller. So I wanted to compare uh, to see if the vibrochord was in any way um, an improvement over the traditional piano and maybe try and identify some possible problem or success areas with the design at that point. So what I did was I had um, two groups, 20 participants. Uh, 10 participants used the vibrochord, and 10 participants used uh, this piano keyboard here. And what I did, so I just, I taped off the notes that weren't involved, and then each one of these keys were then directly mapped to the same keys of, of the vibrochord. So, um, so 10 used the vibrochord, 10 used the piano, and what they were presented with 12 short little vibrotactile phrases that they were asked to repeat. So sort of like the, the children's game Simon, where there's uh, like, it's, you know, buzzing or button, an order of buttons that they have to press, so it, and then they have to play it back, and if they do it right, they can continue. So that was the same kind of thing, short little three, four, five note clips that were presented to them, and then they had to practice, uh, repeat them. So the participants were presented with a touch screen that looked like this, so they controlled the flow. They were able to repeat the stimuli as often as they needed, I actually used that as a measure. And they were encouraged to practice as much as they felt comfortable. And when they were ready, they could make the final attempt, and then that was logged as their final attempt, and that's what I um, compared against what was actually presented to them. So. As it seems, um, so this is uh, the number of errors made per note, so how accurate they were at picking the correct notes. So as you can see, p the group who used the vibrochord made statistically fewer errors per note than people who used the, pro uh, they used the piano keyboard. So I think we could probably say that's, uh, the reason for that is because the mapping, the software mapping, is specifically built for the vibrochord, but you know it's not it's not uh, perfectly obvious that that would have an effect, um, and so what we see is the the the, the more uh, more aligned mapping probably resulted in uh, less cognition being used to maintain those key groups, so where the vibrations switched in location. Um, so another interesting um, result was the number of repetitions. So it seems that. Maybe because the vibrochord was so new that participants felt they needed a little more practice before they, they attempted it. 
So um, you can see that the participants who used the Bible chord made more repetition, so they repeated the phrase more on average than people who use the piano keyboard. And it may be, you know, if you're a musician and you see a keyboard, you may, ju you may just feel confident because you're, you, it's, it's a familiar <coughs> controller to you. Um, okay. And finally, uh, another interesting finding was there were differences in intensity errors. And I'm not quite sure the reason for that. It could be a, re a result of the different uh, hardware mapping. So, for example, when you press a key on either keyboard, an electronic signal that represents a number is, is uh, outputted. So those, the mappings of force to number may not be exact. And so that, the differences could come into play there. <clears throat> so I think we'd have to look at uh, hardware that's similar, possibly from the same manufacturer, in order to really drill down to what, what the difference is there, why that difference is there. So it appears that the vibrocord can facilitate uh, an increase in player accuracy. Uh, so fewer errors per, per, per note. And as I said, it's probably a result of the, the, the software mapping aligning better with the actual hardware interface. The larger key size uh, didn't seem to affect timing accuracy. So that, uh, that gave me an, uh, an indication that I should maintain the size. Although I didn't test very, very quick high tempo phrases. So that's a limitation of this study. Um, and players seem to make more mistakes when we add additional features. So what I, these are grouped by, <clears throat> by groups of melodies. So this group here are melodies that stay in one location. And these are melodies that move on lo in location. And then these are chords, so two notes played at the same time. So you can see that on both, with either, either the vibrachord or the piano, there's a, an increase as, as you move, move through the, the trials. Okay, so the, uh, the next study I did was I wanted to determine if the vibrochord um, and, it, and the system, you know, including the Emoti chair, is a useful system for composing and producing vibrotactile music. And then I wanted to begin to, to look at what characteristics uh, of these vibrotactile songs are contributing to uh, emotional conveyance. Okay? Okay, so I had three composers compose and produce. So in one session, they decided what notes to play and then actually produced the notes in a way that they could be replayed back at a later time. So they sort of did two things at once, which is actually not such a rare thing. Um, so I asked them to compose a happy and a sad song of two to three minutes in length. And then later on, I analyzed the compositions. So. Um, what I found was, so first of all, I relaxed the p-value a little bit for this analysis because what I'm going to do is take this data and use it in the next study and do a more systematic study to kind of to help determine the effect of these characteristics just in another way, in a little more systematic way. So what I found, and so these are, at this point, we, we can't really know if uh, if the songs are truly conveying the emotion, we haven't tested that yet. But what we can say is that the composers at least thought that these things would convey the emotion. So, for example, notes per second and jumps per second. So that's basically the tempo and how often the note moves around on the chair. Those were under 0 0.5. And then these ones, it's a little hard to see here. These are light gray. These are significant if you use the, a relaxed p-value of 0.85. Um, and then, so that is average note length and lengths per jump, and also lengths per second. Okay, so lengths means, it, did it jump from group one to two, or from one to eight? So that, th those are bigger jumps, so I counted those. Okay, so, um, so what is, it appears that, uh, that the vibrochord in conjunction with some off-the-shelf software called Adobe Audition, is a useful system for uh, composition. In fact, one of the composers was having so much fun that he asked to do a third composition, which I didn't include in this, in this analysis. So it seems that composers thought tempo, average note length, number of track jumps, and the length of jumps was a major indicator of emotion. Okay? Um, it, it seems that these composers didn't think that the average track position or jump directionality, so whether the jump go mostly went up, or mostly went down. It doesn't seem like these composers thought that was important. Okay. So, 
Moving into study four, which has two phases. So the first phase was to test to see if the intended emotion is actually being conveyed. So I had composers compose a happy and sad song, and now I'm going to present those happy and sad song, songs to an audience and have them rate it as on a happy and sad uh, dichotomy. Okay. So, uh, and then in my second phase, what I did was I took what I learned from, the, from phase one and from the previous study to create a more systematic uh, study where I systematically varied characteristics and then tested all of them in a, in a, larger, in a larger study. And from that, I um, extracted a regression model. Okay, so let me just go through the details here. Um, so in study... Uh, this is the result from phase one. So it seems that at, at least, com this is composer one, this is his happy song, and this is his sad song. And so one represents very sad, three is neutral, and five is very happy. So at least composer one, his sad song was, you know, they're statistically different from each other, but they were rated fairly close to two and four. So at least one of the composers, and I think you could argue these composers as well, these, this is composer two, happy, sad, composer three, happy and sad, that they were at least successful with their sad songs. Maybe not, maybe it's, it's possible it's more difficult to be happy or they just didn't have the, the tools or the ability at this time. Um, but at least with their sad songs, it appears to be below, uh, you know, closer to, to sad. Okay. Um, Another interesting finding was the enjoyment rating. So it seems, although the happy song got a high enjoyment rating, it seems that the, uh, the other songs of the other composers were enjoyed roughly the same. Okay, so from what we can conclude is that conveying basic emotions, uh, happy and sad, through vibrotactile music uh, is, uh, is possible, at least. Okay, maybe not always, but it's, I've shown that at least one person was definitely able to do it. Okay? Okay, now, on to phase two. So what I did now, so, you know, I'll admit that the first, uh, the results from phase one are fairly unsystematic. I just had artists create things and, you know, what they created is what I tested. So what I wanted to do now is using that is do, try and do at least a, a slightly more systematic study. So what I did was I took the, um, the variables from the from the previous study that I found to be significant, um, and I also I added frequency as well because that I wasn't I'll, I can explain that later in the question period I wasn't able to extract frequency analysis from uh, the previous study so I added that into this study to examine the effect of frequency and I also uh, the jumps category I combined into one because they were so uh, tightly coupled. So what I have here is so five characteristics that I want to study. I want to study the effect, their effect on emotion. So if, if let's say I were to have five levels for each, that would be five to the power of five combinations. A lot of combinations, too many to study all at once. So what I did is I, for each, so this is an example of when I wanted to look at the effect of average note length. So I have one, two, three, four levels of average note length that change from 0 0.2 to 0 0.8. And then I have, I repeat this, one with a happy cohort. So all the other variables I set at happy levels based on what I learned from the previous experiment. And then in the other cohort, I set the other variables at sad levels. So for example, here, notes per second was held at eight. And then here, notes per second was held at three. And then the average note length was varied from through through its range. So I did this basically for each one of these characteristics, and that ended up in 67 clips. Um, that uh, I think how many participants did I have? 30 participants rated 67 clips. Um, and so what I did was I uh, did a regression analysis on the results. And from, uh, from this is the result of that regression analysis. So it appears that notes per second and frequency is able to predict the emotional rating of, of vibrotactile music. Um, so it seems that as you go up in notes per second and frequency, so as you have a higher tempo and a higher note frequency, the emotional rating of the vibrotactile music will increase. Okay. <clears throat> How am I doing for time? I think I'm pretty much...
kind of at the end, right? Yeah. Okay, so um, the conclusion is uh, the clip. It seems that the clip's number of notes per second and note frequency seem to predict the emotional rating of a vibrotactile clip. So just quickly, some of the limitations of this study. I only tested one prototype, only one, and I tested against um, other audio music controllers. So that's a limitation. I only used the basic emotions of happy and sad. Um, I relied on self-report for this. I didn't take any physiological measures. Um, I imposed the emotions on ratings. So I, told, I gave people, you can only respond this or this. I didn't give them, it wasn't an open-ended response, so that's a possible limitation. And I didn't look at any longitudinal effects, so any learning effects or just things that occur over a, a longer period of time. So some final conclusions. Um, the vibrocord seems to be a, vi a viable instrument for composing and producing vibrotactile music presented through the emoji chair. Uh, vibrotactile music, it seems, is able to convey hap the simple emotions of happy and sad. And it seems that the tempo and average note frequency of a vibrotactile song uh, seem to be largely responsible for the conveyance of happiness and sadness. Um, so future work, uh, looking at other emotions, obviously, maybe a more full factorial design to look at to get the full, you know, the, the full effect of all those characteristics working together. I admit this is what I reported on was just a preliminary study. Um, I want to incorporate some of the design ideas I, I received uh, in my very first study. Uh, like a foot pedal. I want to look at different modes for the. I know I looked at the group to place mapping mode, but there are, I have other modes in mind that I have worked with. Um, also, we're developing a file format and a new and a player that will so store the multi-track audio in one file, and then a player that will easily play it back. Uh, and finally, some acknowledgments. My committee, obviously, my supervisors, uh, my f my family. My parents, uh, Dr. Frank Russo, uh, he's a professor at Ryerson. He's been a tremendous uh, resource over the years. Uh, David Bobier, uh, my friend Robert Skelhorn, who uh, he helped me lots on this thesis, participated in it. And of course, the people who paid the bills and Sir Ian Grant. And that's it. Is that a round of questions? Is that okay. So you've done a lot, Carmen. So good job on that. Thanks. Um, I'm going to try to be constructive as opposed to making you defend stuff on the line here. Okay. Um, can you help explain to me, with respect to sound, we can use the ear to hear. With respect to vibrations, is yeah. it only skin that's that's able to perceive it, or are there other parts of the body that's, that's capable of perceiving the vibrations that we're Well, I think I, by vibrations, I mean mechanical vibrations, so anything. And um, no, as far as... Uh, no sense. Uh, touch and hearing would be the only two that can sense mechanical vibration, right? So smell and taste are chemical, and, and sight are, are, are is light. So, okay. I'll let you jump in. Yeah. Well, he 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 had, he had a word there, right? Vest vestibular. So maybe you should pick up on that. Oh, you mean um, uh, 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 proprioception? Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. He's wondering if people are moving around much in the chair because of the vibration. If they're moving? Yeah, yes. I, you mean like squirming around? No, or no, no, no. <laughs> is the vibration pushing them around? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> they're, they're fairly weak. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you're sitting down, I mean, weight is one of the problems because some, they're pushing down so much, sometimes the vibrator doesn't vibrate as much. Because they are, and I mean that—that that is an effect. So there's no, there's no, there's no sympathetic body vibration occurring. In the well, I'm, you know, if you if you apply if you apply a vibrator to the skin, your skin is going to vibrate. That's, but no, that's no other parts. Well, not just the skin. I'm, there's, I mean, it depends on you know what's beneath the skin. So there's bone conduction. I mean, that's a big part, right? Obviously. Uh, I mean, yeah. So anything, if that's what you mean about what is vibrating, I thought you meant what is sensing vibration. But no, of course, um, bone conduction plays a big part in it, and uh, part of the reason why um, it's part of the reason why I can't use just earplugs. So in my studies, I deafen participants, but I have to do it by playing loud white noise because earplugs actually make it worse because then you can you can 
you can you hear mostly the bone conduction. So the white noise covers that, the, whatever you hear in the bone conduction. So absolutely, your whole body uh, will vibrate, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the reason I post this is both, you know, I was wondering if other parts, you know, if your entire body is moving or if it's isolated. And the second component to this is, you know, what's happening inside. Right? So bone conduction is, yeah. to, or the bones, the things that are trembling that, you know, is, is being sensed here. Yep. And your literature review only talks about skin. Right. right. And so that's one of the limitations that I think, I, I don't know whether okay. or not it's worth for you to, to address or not. Yep. Um, the other aspect of your literature review, I looked and saw when you talked about the design of the musical instrument, there were three pieces that you talked about primarily, Omadrin and Wonderland or Orion or the two that you focused on, I forget what the third one was. Yep. Why did you pick those three? Those three? Um, well, they were they were one of the only examples of people who looked at musical instruments as opposed to just sort of more generic controllers. Um, so I, I used them. That that was primarily the reason. Uh, and digital musical instruments to boot. So uh, I, I, I thought that sounded like a, a reasonable place to start. So are you making the argument that what you built is not controllers? No, I've absolutely built a controller, but it's a special subset of controllers called musical controllers, which have a few more uh, specific considerations that say more generic controllers like a mouse, which can be used to do, it's more general use. Uh, so musical controllers have uh, considerations that controllers like those don't. So I did a quick search on Google Scholar for design musical instrument, and yeah. there were quite a few that came back. Yeah. Um, not criticizing the three that you picked, and I was, I was hoping to hear that you said, you know, maybe these are the seminal pieces of work that everyone has to cite or, or everyone refers to. Right. But it might help. It, I appreciate the depth of analysis that you did on, on their, their work. Yeah. Um, but it might make sense to include some sort of breadth in terms of you know, coverage of what's, what's been done in the field as well. Okay. Um, you have a very small number of participants in all of these studies, um, yeah. in particular looking at the performers. Um, how do you justify that small number of composers with all performers? So in the composers, um, that was just, uh, so I think, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I recognize that limitation. I think I tried to mitigate that somewhat by, um, so taking just what I learned from the first study, which looks like three composers, which only resulted in a, a small amount of stimuli, um, and then using that to do a, a, a larger, more systematic study. So I tried to mitigate that as best uh, as I can, um, and um, so was it specifically just the, the about the only three composers that were, or the the other studies as well? I thought the other studies were were small in numbers of uh, well, no, I mean the the audience one. I think you did a good job of because you had a larger number. Right, yeah. exactly. Um, small number of composers in the first two studies, right? Right. So for example, uh, like Nielsen, I don't think I talked about Nielsen in the literature review, but he, there's sort of, uh, well, he's shown form mathematical formulas, but the rule of thumb is basically four or five users, you get about 80 to 90 percent of your problems, your usability problems, mm -hmm. and it's sort of, there's a diminishing, it's a point of diminishing returns, where so if you add a sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth user, at least in study one, I probably wouldn't learn anything new. Mm -hmm. So that was primarily the reason why I only would use four in that case. I just wanted to, you know, find any of the big, big major problems that maybe were game stoppers. As far as the, the next one, I felt comfortable using only three composers, like I said, because I was going to move on to a more systematic. Uh, so Nielsen is primarily about usability. Yeah. Right? Now, for this kind of work, wouldn't it make more sense to to do a study where you're looking at the utility or the possible space of, you know, the coverage that your your instrument could potentially allow for people to explore? Uh, I think that was a, usability. yeah, well, I think, you know, it was to some degree a usability study. I wanted to, I wanted to know if it was usable, and in this case, it was just usable for a very specific task. Um, so I think it would be a, just a little premature to, to, to try and look at everything all at once. Mm -hmm. So I just, I wanted to uh, just refine the rare, very rough edges, at least initially, to get rid of any of the major problems. And then of course, moving forward, 
you know, I want to look at a much more a broader range of you know possibilities of, of use. Mm -hmm. okay. I like what you did with study two. Um, with study three, I like what you did as well. But there was one aspect of the analysis that that I'm kind of worried about. Yeah. So you held the frequency constant, but you're trying to make a claim about the average notes per frequency. Is that right? For was for which one? Phase two. Phase two. Phase three. Phase. So study four. Phase two. This one. Oh wait, you're right. Sorry. Yeah. Go to the next slide. The one with the regression one. model? Yeah. yeah. So the average note frequency, you were saying that, were people, what the comment was, the, the claim that you're, you were making about the results here? So that um, you can predict largely the emotional rating right. by looking at the uh, notes per second and the average note frequency. Yeah, so... Ah, I see. It's notes per second. It doesn't have the frequency that you're using. Exactly. So you could have 80 hertz going, du -du 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 -du, right? That's that's what I mean by notes per second. Okay. Right. Is there any concern that you, by holding the frequency constant here that affects your results? Well, in this, this was just one cohort. I had so I had when I examined frequency, I did I I varied it. So there were a lot of clips, and I think that is a limitation. There were a lot of clips that had 215. Mm -hmm. The majority of them did, right? S same as the majority of the notes per second were eight. Oh, okay. um, yeah, so, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so, go to your contribution slide. Sorry, I don't know how, how we're doing this. Do I keep going for a moment? Okay. I could go on forever, so. <laughs> 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 All right, I won't go on forever. So, contribution number one. I have designed, constructed, and evaluated an input device called a vibral cord. My suggestion is that you don't use that as your contribution, right? Because building a tool without, uh, I think your contribution is that needs to be more specific, right? It's about what what features went into or design considerations went into this particular tool and therefore it enabled the following things as opposed to, you know, um, it's like building a hammer, right? I built the hammer, well, you could have used lots of things to, to, to hit a nail into a wall, but what is it about this hammer that made it so great? Okay. Does that make sense? Right. Um, so, so maybe focus on more the, the system, no, the I software would, layer? I would say, what, what is it, the nuance, maybe, if that's what you think. Is yeah, I think primarily system. that's, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, then contribution number three is the other one that I am worried a lot about. So the simple emotions, you, I, you're only doing two. I don't understand why you have to try to mask it at this level, just saying we're trying we, to, to convey happy, happy sad. versus sad. Right. right. Sure. Okay. I'll pass her now and I'll come back to my okay. question so that <coughs> I don't go on to it. I want to pick up from uh, the trans uh, questions. In fact, uh, looking at the slides there, uh, I noticed that you started to look into this instrument, which is a piano style or keyboard style yep. instrument. Yeah. Is there, was there any reason to, to use that as a controller design? Yeah, it's, well, it was more a necessity because there aren't any other, there's no other vibrotactile controllers for vibrotactile so music. So you started and uh, thought that it's much easier for you to build and validate, yeah? Well, I mean, it, I, had to, I wanted to compare it against something, okay. and that was sort of the closest thing, that if I were to use a pre-existing controller, that's what I would have used. So I wanted to compare it to something, at least so I could I could start off. Okay. Uh, going back to the contribution, one my question around the design of this uh, controller, the Vibercore. Yeah. Um, how did you start? It means that what was your design criteria to go after that? Why did you choose eight, you know, keys for that? Sure. Initially, how you space them? How do you pick and choose the groups of the notes? And 
Yeah. Have you, what is the relationship, overall I want to understand, what is the relationship with the emoji chair, overall, sure. uh, how these things are connected to each other? Yep, yeah. so um, a lot of it comes back to this stuff here. So, um, so what I, so for example, I, part of the VibraCord is the, is the, sys, the software system, the controlling system, right? So uh, part, of, part of what I, uh, of where I started was with the literature review. So for example, the, the frequency range is smaller. So that's an easy one. I don't present any frequencies outside of that range, right? That was, that's easy. Okay. The second one is the larger differences between notes. So, um, your frequency at the fairly hertz low. Yeah. yeah, I did that for a couple of reasons because I mean, so a thousand hertz is the theoretical threshold, yeah. and I mean that's that's stuff reported on, you know, placed directly on the skin, yeah. on say the f and so a lot of the, some of the literature looks at the fingertip, some looks at the forearm, some and it's so it's not a very cohesive picture. So I wanted to leave a a big margin. Of air. And then people are wearing clothing, exactly. and there's all of these issues. So I wanted to leave, you know, a fairly large margin. Okay. And same with the difference. So in the literature review, again, it's not crystal clear. It looks about the the difference is about 20%. So if you let's say on your fingertip, if you present 100 hertz and then 120 hertz, usually you can tell that difference. So I used a 40% difference. So that's Larger. factor 1.4 that you are using there. Yeah. You mentioned somewhere in the your thesis that that can be also variable. What you did right. not, you kept it as a constant between the frequency and that those right. eight frequency. That so have. I tried to draw from Western music as much as possible. So from so where I could, I, I tried to mimic what was done in, in Western music. So that's the piano, the, the frequencies on the piano use a, 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 f a factor, the 12th root of 2. Right? So I wanted to mimic that in the hopes of maybe, uh, maybe mimicking some other things, for example, like octaves, maybe. Um, and so that's, uh, that's why I used that factor. But I mean, 1.4 is fairly arbitrary. You, you know, there's, it could be 1.45 or 1.5, but you know, it's it's there's a limit. I mean, once you get too too big, then then you're going to run up against your the, the boundary, the edge. So that can be something that uh, somebody can really well adjust. But I'd I'd say there's definitely there's that. limits, right? Oh, there's okay. limits for sure. Yeah, because you don't want them to be too close. Because okay. if they're too close, then then what's the point? It's almost like having the same two notes with the same okay. frequency. So uh, on sense. the terms of limitation, I know you talked about the frequency. Um, regarding that, you are talking about uh, composers and performers and the audience here. So yeah. what are those uh, uh, the limitations? What about those factors in designing as a control? And your study, I noticed that you have done quite a bit of, you know, uh, you call it validation or study on this. Which yeah. you spent, I believe, that quite a bit of your time on this thesis working yeah. on that side. Yeah. I want to see what's the impact on the improvement of the design. How how that came to help you to you know improve or propose a better controller for the system. So how did my how did my work yes. with the studies influence say yeah. how I set the the frequencies? Exactly the frequencies or other. Um, they it haven't at this point. Uh, specifically the frequencies. I mean, um, part of the input in from the very first study where I just had four musicians, I adjusted the amplitude mapping, but um, I didn't, uh, at this point I didn't see any, any of the results. Um, I mean, it's clear that its frequency is important, but I didn't see any results that suggested a reason to change that factor. At this point, so either so changing the factor would would push the boundary up a little bit. So maybe I don't. Know, looking back now, maybe um, increasing that factor a little bit uh, because there was a, a small. It was only a small effect of frequency. So maybe increasing that factor could in, could increase that effect. But yeah. So overall, when I read this thesis, I noticed that you started strongly on 
justifying your controller design and so on, yeah. and explain the setup and so on. But later on, as soon as you started the validation, I don't see much of it going back and improve the design. I didn't see that. Then it's like a two separate parts in this right. work. I don't see much of a feedback to go back to improve your design uh, as a suggestion of collaboration. Okay. I did, um, yeah, I, I, I admit a lot of, so uh, a lot of the sort of suggested improvements I, di I didn't have time to implement, yeah. say. So for example, people suggested a foot pedal or other other modes or I did some of the, I tried to validate where possible and if there were so for example they thought it was too high and so I that was easy to fix so I tried I lowered it down or I you know it seemed that the key size didn't affect things too much so I left it but that was that was always a consideration is whether or not because even the first musician I that came in the version of the keyboard I had had six seven and eight keys there were different yeah. and so I, I had him use different different sizes so I, I did I think early on uh, at, you know I tried to get as much improvement in but then but then I needed the validation phase and I can't I didn't really want to change it while I'm in the midst of validating. So you assume that your design is a base design and you want to just see that how it works. Exactly and to see if is it a complete disaster or is it at least so a step in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. With with leaving up the op opportunity to to make improvements in the future. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that makes sense. So uh, I'll pick up on uh, one of the questions from uh, Kai. Uh, okay. the, I guess the vestibular system has the you know same like canals and they're full of fluid or just pretty viscous. Right. So uh, I guess you would say that you don't think. You know, as much movement of that fluid when that when you're in the chair and it's vibrating. No, I don't think so. So that would be a consideration, right? No. Okay. Right. No, I don't think so. But I mean, even if it did, I mean, it all kind of goes into that package of what it is to experience vibration. I mean, I'm sure when you experience sound, that you know whatever it is in your ear, it's. I mean, who knows what's being vibrated? But it all comes together and that is experiencing sure, but sound. The, but the movement caused by the tympanic membrane of the ear is probably going to be a lot smaller than you know, the large vibrations past the body. Sure, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the, the body had resonant frequencies and you know, yep. transport could move. Yep. Um, okay, so so perhaps as a literature review, I think Kyle kind of was mentioning, you know, you might want to just check in literature if there's anything about the response of the, uh, the vestibular system to vibration as distinct from uh, head movements. I mean, I'm, I'm skeptical. I don't think it's going to do much, but, but you should probably cover that off as a, as a possible base. Okay. Okay. What's music? What is music? What is music? Uh, music um, are is um, patterns of vibration. Okay, that's that's a very self-serving definition <laughs> because it means you get out of you get out of jail free. I don't believe it. <laughs> I think I think music is 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 inherently sound based, and to say that it's vibration uh, is to is to say something different. I think I, I don't know. I mean, you're assuming that that music uh, that, that there's a thing corresponding to music that's experienced with vibration only, without the involvement of acoustic, uh, auditory sensing, right? Yes. And that to me is an assumption. I, I think if you're going to if you're going to make that assumption, you should justify it, or you should at least state it. Okay. Because I think really you're just assuming it. Some people might get I have the same comment in the PDF I was working with as well. So you're saying that... Um, I think you have to say that you have your version of music. Or, you know, you're assuming that there is a vibratory analog of music that's based on the structural form, right? Right. Um, and you're say, and your, your assumption is, and I know, I know it's all about inclusiveness and universality, <laughs> and everybody should have music, but you know, it may be qualitatively different. Uh, it may be that it should have a different name. It should be called you know, vibratory, vibratory. It well, it's called vibrotactile. Music. It is. I mean, I do differentiate. Music, I, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not okay. Chinese music is always common. Yes. yes. It, it, has, it has a whole artistic connotation to it, and it's not, I'm not sure whether people recognize that yet. Okay. I'm going to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you think that people were actually judging? when they said what emotion was being conveyed. 
I mean, like in the map back to sweet, but that, 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 that. I mean, everybody agrees that's happy, right? Right. And you can hear it happy. Right. Were they really experiencing happy, or were you asking them to do a kind of as if judgment? Yeah. Like no, so I don't believe they actually felt the emotion of happiness. So, you know, when I listen to Agnes Day, some, you know, and I really listen, I'll, you know, I'll get a little really sad in addition to being able to identify it objectively as being sad. So I don't think the participants were feeling emotion. They were... Or a funeral march. Right. Yeah. They, weren't, they weren't on the verge of tearing up, which is why I didn't really... I, I thought doing physiological measures wouldn't show anything because they are, you know, they are... They are you know, and not Agnes Day doesn't always move me, what, some, but I could always identify, oh, that is definitely sad song. So I think... Largely, what they were probably identifying is the tempo is the large part, yeah. and and the and, and you know and the frequency, which so, is. So I, I may have missed it because you know, yeah. I'm not always the most detail-oriented person. Okay. There is this distinction between sort of visceral emotion and affective emotion. Yes. And I wonder if, if you've kind of covered off that base. I Cause don't. Because I think you yeah. treat emotion as emotion, and maybe you should explain that you're dealing with a certain kind of emotion, which is a reflective emotion. Yeah. That's kind of. As I say, it's kind of as if where they're trying to say, you know, what the thing's being conveyed here. Right. They're actually experiencing it viscerally. Okay. I, I f don't think I have that in there. It, it should be in there. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Okay. Um, what the regression analysis? Yes. <laughs> this is what well, first like to go after. Okay. So, what what method of entry did you use? Do you remember? Uh, stepwise. Stepwise. Step 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 wise. Wise. Okay. So you then created. Yeah, stepwise is an exploratory procedure, right? Yes. And based on the step, stepwise, with no validation, and no you know testing and training sample, whatever, you've come up with this Toronto model. It's a glorious name, right? Yes. <laughs> to me, and, and there's three decimal places, <laughs> no, 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 that's right. Yeah. I, I think that's a little bit over the top myself. I think you know if you're using stepwise regression, then you have to sort of state that you know the model is exploratory, is exploratory technique. And that what you have is really a hypothesis, okay. rather than, rather than okay. a model that's being tested. Um, okay, to go along with that, uh, you you didn't present the correlation matrix, right? So in your experiment, you kind of designed the, the independent variables, right? The setting, the, the level. So it's yeah. not quite like a naturalistic regression where you know people have different different quantities. Mm -hmm. So you actually you actually influenced the model in a way by designing the levels of the independent variables. And it would be interesting to see the correlation matrix to see whether, in fact, there are systematic correlations that were built into the relationships between the independent variables, right? Um, right. Yes, I do think that there definitely were some intercorrelations. Because such a funny number, right? It seems like it's 67, right? Well, 67. because the reason I did that was... That's a prime number, isn't it? Um, <laughs> there were, because there were some... So I wanted... Uh, to l some of not all of the groups, uh, could I could have the same number in because of limitations. So like notes per second, I could only go so fast yeah. before I. So with frequency, I, I could go a little further. So some groups had five or six. Some groups had four. Yeah. So. So I'd be interested in seeing the correlation matrix. So I'd okay. like to know what relationships were between the variables because that may have influenced your model. Now I know it's mostly to do with the correlations between each of the individual independent variables and the dependent variable, but yeah. still the relationships between independent variables can screw you up, right? Because then, you know, if there are strong correlations, then they're substitutable for each other. So at right. the very least, you should present the correlation matrix so people can check that. Okay. So and make sure you, you throttle back your claims about the trauma model. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in the piano versus vibrachord comparison, I sort of feel like it, it would depend very strongly on the task that you carry out. So when you do that comparison, you know, if you made it a different task, maybe the piano would do better. I don't well, I sort of I had three types of tasks yeah. in a way. Right, I had single notes or single melodies that stayed in one area. Right. So that was when they would only have to play within one group, right? And then there was one that moved between groups, so they had to move, and then one where they played two notes at the same time. So I think that's a fairly. You think that's representative. I th I, at least initially, I mean, there's more, but I think that's a fairly, uh, you know, it, it covers a lot, I think. Do you have a justification? I, I don't know why you chose those classes. Um, no. It'd be nice if, like, person no. X in a similar situation 
use those tasks or if they're, you know, well, rather sort of than make it up. And if you're going to make it up, that's great. But you should probably say something about how you made it up. Well, it just seemed to... I don't, those just seem like three major things that you can do with it. Um, how do you learn how to play the piano? How do I learn how to play the piano? <laughs> how do I? Why? How do I learn? I learn how to play the piano. How do I learn? I just play. Well, I think it'd be great but there's no such that. thing as groups uh, in in piano. No, I mean, there's within, octaves, no, no, but you stay within a group. You stay within the octaves. You know, yeah. Beyond the, um, the first okay. Yeah, that's yeah. That's how you learn to play piano. I mean, it'd be great <laughs> if you could sort of like if there's sample from piano instruction, which talks about basic skills and how to mm. develop and stuff. I mean, again, it's just a small base to cover off. Okay. Um, okay, I'll stop there for now. Come back later. Sorry, I just Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a problem with people who are on music. Well, it's but just so mean, intuitive. They take for granted. Yeah, 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 they take for granted. <laughs> they take that, yeah. Whereas I don't. <laughs> that part. Um, okay. So, uh, just, the, um, you use Monarchy and the Country as your thing mm -hmm. for the evaluation yeah. process. Um, and then you said it was usability. So how do those two things compare? Because usability is something a little bit different than what you were doing. Um, well, I mean, this is, it, this is a special flavor of, of um, usability. Um, I mean, certainly I was looking to examine how usable the vibrocord was for doing a specific subset of, um, of tasks. Um, as far as um, the difference, are you getting the difference between like HCI and let's say human factors? No, or? no, so you know, first what are, what are the things that if you look at any sort of HCI textbook, yeah. you see what usability is made up of. Right. Well, so um, you four things too, but they were a bit different. Well, for 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 musical instruments, the the major difference is that timing. Although timing is a, a big factor in, in HCI, it's mostly you know how fast. Let's do this in the fastest possible way. So, but with the, with musical instruments, it's it's a timing is very important, but it's also a little bit different in that. It's a very specific timing, so it's not just do it as quickly as you can. It's do this at exactly this time, and then do another thing at exactly this time, which is um, that's one of the major differences from just sort of more generic HCI and human factors. Okay, so what are what are the things that you know, generic usability formulation measures? So uh, efficiency, ease of use. Uh, learnability, and uh, I had some notes here. Aesthetics. Yeah, user satisfaction, ease of use, learnability, user satisfaction, efficiency. So, I mean, those are all those are all so present. That's not there. No, no. On that list, some of them are. Yeah. Um, so in this, but so it, I mean, it is. I mean, ease of use. Uh, so ease of use is is a funny one because. You know, if you look at the guitar, for example, let's look at the guitar, very popular instrument. You know, if you did an analysis, especially a new user, you would say that is a terribly difficult instrument to use. It's, it's hard, right? The strings will damage your fingertips, and, it's, and you have to curve your hand in a weird way, and moving up actually, or moving down increases the sound. It's a horrible controller. But I don't think uh, most experienced musicians wouldn't say that. They say a lot of those things are actually good. They're features of the instrument. 
Um, so ease of use is, is, is a little bit of a different beast uh, with when looking at musical instruments. Um, but the other ones are primarily there. Learnability, explorability are kind of tied. Um, and, uh, but timing controllability is, is the most important. And it's a little bit different in that it's specific timing, not just the, most, the fastest way of doing something. Well, it's, this is such a new area. Um, I think this was just a way of, of breaking ground and starting somewhere. So, you know, I can't, obviously I can't explore everything all at once. So I think this was a good way of, uh, of starting out and, and um, you know, and getting, getting started on exploring this area where there isn't, there isn't much really in, in existence right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. What pieces would you give to somebody else to say, okay, take this away and make a new instrument that's not a keyboard, it's something else? Not a keyboard. Um, well, certainly at least the, the, you know, looking at the software layer and the system of music uh, it would, would probably be the most useful for applications on in other areas or other, you know, other controllers, other devices. Right? So, you know the Western system. I tried to basically create an analog to the Western system system of music, but for vibrotactile music. Um, you have a, a regression hypothesis. Right. Well, I think that would probably be aimed more at our, our composers and artists. So, you know, if you are a, an artist starting in a brand new domain where you have no zero knowledge, I mean, this is at least a starting point where you can you can start here. Uh, if you're interested in, you know, creating this type of music. And so at least you are, you know, any, any good musician needs to have some background in music theory before they can start to be artistic. So I think this is I a... I think uh, some of them disagree with you on that one. Well, no, but yeah, even... Not, we don't need to talk about that. No, but even if, if you don't have... You're always blues guys. <laughs> they, have, they have knowledge. It's just not... It's, it's, in, uh, it's not formally music. written down. But they have knowledge. They know about scales. They know about uh, modes and chords and chord progressions. They just didn't learn that of a book. But they, they definitely have knowledge of that theory. It just may not be, they may not be able to express it in a... They didn't learn it through experience. So... That's true. But they learned through experience. So you have... Yes. So you have a system... A set of system recommendations. Right. But then you also have these, your, your hypothesis about notes and frequency, notes per second timing, yeah. and frequency being things that affect how people play, right. and then how people understand or right. experience, I guess. Right. So how, how would you give that to somebody else to make a new thing that can that could play, and that could allow somebody well, well, for example, if you're maybe you're uh, you work you're working on a cell phone interface and you want to know about you want to have a, a, a vibration ringtone that is happy or sad. Well, this this again might is a place to start, right? Um, or uh, I don't think I I think the regression model is less useful to instrument designers and constructors than it is to instrument users. I think um, primarily the results of these studies uh, will be helpful to designers in the sense that okay the design that was used seemed to result in a you know a decent system so maybe we could try and mimic that system. But I think primarily the regression analysis is aimed at players rather than instrument designers. 
because it doesn't say anything about say the range or the you know the note difference. Right, but but still, um, you know the number of notes per second that you can feel is limited. It has a limitation. Yes. Right. Yes. So you wouldn't want to design an instrument that would allow you well, to play beyond that limit. But you wouldn't I wouldn't you wouldn't impose that limitation. So I'm sure that limitation exists in sound, but you wouldn't say put an art you wouldn't put something on a guitar to stop someone from really shredding. Right? So I mean <laughs> No, there but, are, but but the guitar playing the guitar does not allow you to go beyond the frequencies that people right. play. No, exactly. So the design of it doesn't allow you to do that. So right. dogs, you don't have a, a, a part of the guitar that allows you to play music for dogs, for instance. Right. No, 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 it's absolutely. It's not possible on a, by the design of that right. guitar. Right. Um, so, <laughs> right? They can hear more frequencies than we do. So <laughs> is that kind of what it is? So it would be the same kind of idea. We are skin can feel beyond a certain level. So you shouldn't design an instrument that will take you, allow you to go beyond. Right. Because it's not. Right. But that's more f based from the literature review that I learned. So the stuff about frequency. I mean, I didn't do any psychophysics testing to test those limits. Yeah, no, no, no. So, so I think, so, you know, using the range that I use seemed to be useful. So I, you know, I would recommend starting with that range to, to someone starting out. Well, I think okay. So so I think there are two categories of change there. As long as you continue to use voice coils, which I didn't, I I didn't really explain that. But so in the emoji chart, voice coils, which are essentially speakers, so a magnet inside an electromagnet. So you can control frequency and amplitude independently and extremely precisely. The other way vibration is sometimes created, like in your cell phone, is a motor with an off-balance weight that spins around. So in that case, you have frequency and amplitude are coupled, and control is, the precision is less. So if you're talking about using a vibration device that uses motors, the, diff the change would be huge. All this goes out the window. It's a different system altogether. As long as you're using voice coils, so multiple voice coils, so in this case, I, at least you know up to eight is what we're on on the channel. So as long as you're using voice coils that are spread out along your body, I think for the most part, what I found would 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 stay, would, would remain. Um, you know, with some with some change, but I don't think it really matters terribly whether it's going up your back or the back of your leg or around your arm or or around your waist. I think people would interpret that largely the same. At least the audience part of it. said at the beginning that the spatial dimension offers an advantage. Yes. But as you went through your studies, it was, you know, it didn't turn out to be something that, that, was, that seemed to have much of it. Right. Um, so is that still an advantage? Do you think that's still useful? Yeah. Um, yes. And so, okay, so although the preliminary results of this study shows that it doesn't seem like the movement has a direct effect on emotion. What that a movement allows you to do, for example, is have a higher notes per second rate. So it may not it may not be the actual movement itself that allows you to convey more emotion, but the fact that you can move means you can have a higher tempo. So for example, let's say you had a cascading effect where the notes occurred very rapidly after each other. That, you know, you couldn't do that, let's say if you only had one speaker you'd be more limited. So um, even though it seems like it doesn't have a direct effect, the ability to encode in space gives you other tools that do have an effect. Thank you. Sure. 
to have a couple of comments and sure. one question, or maybe a few questions. Um, I didn't catch this the first time I read your dissertation, and as you're presenting, as you're answering the questions, I looked through, and you were very smart in the way that you frame the what the system enables or does, right? It, it allows, sorry, from, from a user's perspective, they're perceiving emotion. They're not experiencing. I heard Deb use the term experience, but it never came out of your mouth. Okay. So that was actually really smart, right? Mm -hmm. And then I looked through the, the, the survey, and you phrased it exactly the way that I, I would have expected you to, to do this. Sorry, uh, I, I had, had you done it right, that would have been how you phrased it, and you did, you did actually do that. You were asking people to, to rate the emotional, um, uh, to, to give an emotional rating of this piece as opposed to like, how do you feel right. from this? Yeah. So that was really good, uh, okay. so kudos on that. Um, let me start with this question, which is, um, a spin on the typical, what would you do differently? I'm not gonna ask you what would you do differently now that you've done this. Uh, but I'm gonna phrase this as, I think the committee made a mistake. I think we made you do too much work in this dissertation. Would you agree? And how would you defend that? That's the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is. Yeah. To, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I think, um, you know, I honestly I haven't read a ton of PhD dissertation. Maybe I should have, uh, so I don't have too much to compare it to. But I think, you know, I think I tried to create, you know, sort of a well, as complete a story as possible. I tried to include as many different tools, so utilizing some of the artist's intuition, but then also sort of including some more systematic stuff. Um, no, I, I think uh, it, you know it for learning about a brand new controller that's doing something very, very new, I think this was a fairly reasonable start. And I, I don't really think it was that. Maybe the, f maybe the final experiment, but I think that was needed. I think it was, I think it was needed to, it's because the first part was so introductory and very unsystematic, I think you needed that second part to round it out. So, so. my feeling is that second part is the more interesting part. The controller part is probably not as strong. Now, is there some way that you think you could have done the second part of the dissertation without needing to do the first part? Um, I, I see. It. You mean the first, like the first study that looked at the design and yeah. sort of improving that? Well, I would say, yeah. If I were, if you, if I were to chop any of the studies, that one. You know, was probably the least significant in, in providing useful useful information. But it did. Um, I guess my point is, yeah. I don't see the point of. Well, actually, I, I do see the point of having the bill and instrument, right? But for a dissertation, if you were to point to like one contribution in your dissertation, what would it be? One is sh uh, is showing vibrotactile music can convey. I mean, do you really need? instrument to do that or can you just do it with all? Do I need the instrument? I well I think it makes it easier. Because okay number one there's there's no vibrotactile music and there's no music that you know like let's say if we were to if I wanted to do a psychological study there's somewhere there's a database somewhere of music that say they say this is happy music. That doesn't exist for vibrotactile music. So but you can Somebody convey, has to create it. But you can convey the live or tactile music without an instrument. But how, how do I create that? How do I how do I get that in existence? You're modeling it somehow, right? So whatever the performer is doing right. gets modeled in but, the system before it gets transplanted through the chair. But I only had a sense of a model after I had the artist had a go at it, you know, and sort of and sort of chopped away the the major. You know the big pieces that really didn't matter. So I think I was sort of in a catch twenty two. You know, I I agree. If I could have just done the the vibrotactile music, I pr I might have done it. But that was one of the problems. There's no way to. D People have done similar things, but they complain. It, it they I quote it was painstaking, yeah. right? So for me to do for someone has has to create it. That someone would probably be me. 
And so I would have I've probably just created a controller anyways to do it, R rather than. Well, variables, but I mean, you mean to to sit down. So the ones to create those little ten second clips that I eventually created, that took me a fairly long time. You know, because I had in text files I was going okay start it here and end it here or you know for this long and that long and then start this note and then end that note and that was only for 10 seconds and very and and it was very repetitious right i could just copy and paste for the most part mm -hmm. that was that was painful so to create a a song i don't know i don't you know i think i think it was needed in a in a roundabout way so how many so you have a whole bunch of uh, bible Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how many are there? Well, and if you're going to try yeah. and do a systematic analysis of all those all variables, like which one, which ones would come out? It doesn't. It's not the same. How many? Well, how many? You said five. Oh no, but that was because I had pared that down because of what I learned from before. Right. But so if I had just started with that first initial list, yes. it many? would have been at least probably a dozen, I mean, ten, ten, around ten. So well, and then, and then you want to look at all the, the levels that you want to look at. So, into the huge, millions, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I think it was it was needed in a sort of a circular way. We need one needed for the other. So, for usability, there's tons of different ways that it can be broken down, right? And so, you know, you point out some, Deb pointed out some. Uh, pull up in a different textbook and they might give you a, a different set of categories as well. So the, well, what I learned is learnability, flexibility, and robustness. Right? Right. Um, when I look at that right there, or when I think about your study, study one, study two, I think the, the aspect of user experience is the thing that you know would have been the more important thing to, to assess as opposed to the usability. And I don't want to hammer on the same point again, but you know that that's something to think about, right? Just it, it might be something to acknowledge as you know we only focus on usability. We didn't really think about probing the, the user experience part right? in terms of like what else would a a, a composer or performer potentially want. Deb talked about um, different uh, devices that you might apply this towards. I think this could potentially be kind of interesting if you, I don't know, I've, got, I've been thinking about like smart homes and that kind of stuff, if the smart home was sad, is there some way that you can, as opposed to like a single yeah. chair, right, as you're walking through a home, is there some way that you can do that? Yeah, yeah. No. yeah right? absolutely, I think it's all, it's, you know, it's one piece in a multimodal yeah. thing, right, so maybe there's Sad lighting, sad sounds, sad yeah. vibrations. Those can all be combined, right, in, into a into a coherent sort of uh, stimulus. Do you think the the same concepts can be applied? So if it's lighting, would it map as well, or do you think you would have to do this? Take take your lighting yeah. and reapply it towards. I don't think I I think. It's fairly interchangeable between sound and vibration, mm -hmm. just because we're dealing with me both mechanical vibrations. But I think when we get into vision, mm -hmm. it's different. Mm -hmm. The it's more complex, I think, um, and uh, it just it doesn't it doesn't cross over in that domain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so speculative questions. I was imagining a use case where hearing impaired people have a special row of motor chairs at a concert. Yep. And I'm wondering, you know, would that be reasonable? Could you do transcription of regular music to be protect the music yes. in general? Yes. So you can do that. We have done that in the past. This is where this work originated from. The problem with, with that is so you either have to do some kind of translation or not. So either if you know, the top part of the piano is theoretically inaccessible. So what are you going to do with music that, that has f frequencies up there? Are you going to shift it down into the range they can? Or are you just, just going to present it to them and, and, and hope for the best? Give it to them on the fingertips or something. Even on the fingertips. What, what happens is even though you can experience it, the <coughs> discrimination ability goes right out the window. So 2,000 and 3,000 hertz would feel pretty much the same. 
So you can do that, and we have done we have done studies that show that. But so what we did is we used the Emoti chair and tried to segment the let's say a mono track of audio into bands, frequency bands, and then present the different bands. So we spread it out that way. But in that case, I mean, there's a lot of overlap between the bands, so it's not perfectly discrete, and you're presenting frequencies that people and differences that people can't differentiate. So they do get something. We've shown that there is you can convey. So if you present a happy audio song through vibration, people will determine it to be happy. Because yeah, they also have non-verbal cues there, which would be helpful probably. Uh, or, or we just did something because it's experiments. No. No, I mean, if a pianist is like doing something. Oh. Thing, yes. You know, oh, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Like, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the the vibe chord seems like a great initial start, but for the future, would a piano accordion have been better? Is that kind of a model? You mean? So like so, it's more vertical. Saxophone, maybe maybe having multiple things playing at the same time is beyond the resolution of the of the medium, or you know. Well, I think. Um, really I'm no, I'm just talking about the actual the actual mechanism of creating music. The form factor. What would be great if, is if I I like the idea of performing, watching the performer, and then hearing the mid chair. So something like piano accordion might be technically. But there is piano. still that aspect. There's that visual performance aspect with the piano keyboard. And I just, I, th I think because, I mean, if you were to ask anyone, you know, name a musical instrument that represents music, people would say piano, I think. And, and most people are familiar but with it. This is Vibratech. Oh, I know, I know, I know. And it's brand new. I mean, and I, I don't, piano is, is I don't want to overwhelm. That's my personal view. It's making things more complex. It's got, you know, big. It's got so many octaves, right? Right. An instrument that's more limited might actually be more representative of what you're doing. So in that case, though, so I, I knew I was going to have, based on my range and my spacing, I was going to have uh, 45 notes. So I think putting that in a smaller form factor like oh, this. Doing that, a French horn. Or like this, some, yeah. like saxophone or something. <laughs> so right with a flute or a saxophone, you have only two octaves. Yes. And because, so there's a key that, you know, so this note is low, and then if you press this key and this key, that's high. Unless you do some funny So you would have to have some sort things. of, yeah, yeah. you know, some paging mechanism. And I, I just thought for the first go around, it's a little bit easier just if it's all laid out and there for you, rather than having to learn this I just paging think you're mechanism. I too much. I do with that one. It's so many options. Okay, last question. Yeah. What about the emoticode? Emoticode? Code, yeah. Uh, could you oh, code. Could, could you put the vibration A vest, in absolutely. There has been many vests. Yeah. And it, you, you can put it in any form factor. Any form factor. Vest, a belt, anything. Uh, it, it so you wouldn't have to make a motor chairs. You could just give them a motor vests when they walk in the door. Right, right. And actually, the version of the motor chair we have, the form factor isn't the greatest for composing, for playing. It's meant for active. It was meant for watching films, so you're laid back. So actually, in in the composition studies, I put I took out the foam and put it in just like a wooden chair, and that was a a better form factor. So there's definitely looking at the motor chair. There's definitely room for improvement in the form factor. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yes, 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 sure. Okay.